Let's turn in John's Gospel to chapter 14. You might have held your place there. If you need a Bible, should be one close in the back of a seat. If you need to tap someone and ask them to pass it down, please do that. We want you to have your Bibles open. You'll be reading, following along, studying with us in John 14. Just three verses for us today, but so much here. Verses 12, 13, and 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, and I remember that's Jesus' way of doing what I do when I <laughs> pay attention. This is important. Jesus is telling his, his apostles this might be on God's final exam. You might want to take notes. Pay attention, boys. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, he will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. So that the Father will be glorified in the Son. Ask me anything, or yours might be translated, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Holy Spirit, speak now. I'm your servant. Tie me to this text. Help us rightly divide this word. And thank you for this word. So convicting, and so often we pray in impotence. But we're thankful that you're omnipotent. So our prayers, oh God, I pray, will change us, the prayers, and make us more like you, for Christ's sake. Amen. When we use the spiritual laws that God has set up, God must obey what we request. Now, I hope you know I didn't say that. I mean, I just said it, but I'm quoting someone, nor do I, would I ever say that. That's a quote from the heretic Kenneth Copeland. Another Copeland quote. You have the same creative faith and ability on the inside of you that God used when he created the heavens and the earth. Kenneth Copeland. More quotes from the Heretics Hall of Shame. Robert Tilton. Do not say, Lord, if it be thy will. Now we just heard Jesus say to say, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. And Jesus himself prayed this in the garden. You imagine the audacity of a wolf, a snake, to stand before God's people and deceive them in such ways. One more from Fred Price. You can have what you say. Now this is a small smattering of what has sadly overtaken the globe. Churches all over the world now are inundated and faithful churches are having to fight against. And Africa is a huge problem. The prosperity, word of faith, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. Interpretations of texts like these. Now I know some of you might be here and you might ask, but isn't that what Jesus said? Ask me anything in my name. I will do it. That is what he said. Did you pay attention to what he said? We're going to, I hope today, avoid the heresies and the fallacies of interpreting a text like this one selfishly, and we'll do so by applying three primary principles of Bible interpretation. If you don't know these automatically, there's three, uh, there, it's not the only three, but three of the big ones. If you're going to rightly divide the word of truth, you need to know these three principles. Number one, context, context, context. We're going to look at these words in their immediate and their original context. 
Uh, number two, grammar and syntax. We're going to look at the words. What do they mean and how are they combined? That's syntax into phrases and sentences to give us our meaning. Number three, we're going to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. We'll do some of that today. I encourage you to do more of it in your small groups together uh, and in your time, even maybe in your home and your families in the weeks ahead. We, we don't have time to put all what the Scripture says about prayer together. We'll do a little bit of it today, though. Here's the big idea that Jesus teaches his 11 apostles in the upper room in our passage today. It's pretty clear, I think, that Jesus is saying his own words and works will get even greater once he ascends back to the Father in heaven. Well, let me say it a little more simply. Jesus' word works. I made one word out of that. I'll tell you why in a minute. Crunched it together and hyphenated it. Jesus' word works will get greater after his ascension. That's the point he's making. The point is less about us praying and getting whatever we want. It's more about Jesus doing what he wants and assuring that he will continue to do his word works in and through the disciples after he departs to the Father. Now I want to admit there's some difficulty for us here. I mean, how in the world could any human do greater works than Jesus? What does that even mean? We're going to look at some of that today. We're going to do this by looking at three key phrases from the big idea. So I want to look at Jesus' word works. It's the first heading. And that's going to answer the question, what, for us. What are these works? What is Jesus talking about? And then we're going to look at Jesus' ascension. That's going to tell us why. Why does he say these works will be done and be greater? And then we're going to look at the whole idea of greater works. And that's going to tell us how. How are they greater and how will this actually happen? How will this be affected? So we're answering what, why, how. Heading number one, think with me about Jesus' word and works or Jesus' word works. What are the works that Jesus says that these apostles will do or the one who believes in him will do? Well, you have the text before you, right? Jesus tells you what they are. He will also do the works that I do. Same works. The works I'm doing, those are the works, the word works that those who believe in me, the one who believes in me will do. Now this, in its context, is pretty important and powerful. Remember what Jesus has just said. We'll go back to verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And the words, you paying attention? The words that I say to you, I speak not on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Do you see how Jesus interweaves his word and his works there? God can never be divorced from his word or his works, and his word cannot be divorced from his works. He works by his word, and his word always works. That's why I've crunched this together and called them Jesus' word works. Do you see what Jesus says his father's works are? The things I say to you. That sounds odd if we're talking about ourselves, but not when you're talking about God the Son and God the Father. God the Father does his works how? By the words Jesus says to them. Now we've seen this repeatedly in John's gospel. Jesus' words are God's words. Jesus' works are God's works. And here in the upper room, Jesus reminds these boys that he does his work by his word and his word always works. Think with me just quickly on a few examples from just John's gospel. We could go to all the other gospels, but... In John's gospel, we have uh, seen, heard about Jesus healing a man at the pool of Bethesda. Do you remember? How did he heal that man? Well, he commanded him, get up, take up your bed and walk. 
You see, he worked by his word. Isn't that something? He worked on the man born blind and smeared mud on his eyes, but then combined that with a word. Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. You see how the word and the works are inseparable. You can't really categorize them. They're so interwoven, interlocked. They go hand in hand. Jesus walks to the tomb of Lazarus and he asks for some work to be done. Move the stone. And then he walks towards the tomb and he cries out with a word, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came forth. Jesus works by his word, and his word always works. And this is a character trait of God in the scripture. And so God, the Father and Son, are one being, one heart, one mind, one will, one purpose, one word. The word works of Jesus... Although, we're going to have to wrestle a little bit here, but that's what he says believers will do. Is that too good to be true? I mean, some of you want to remind me, I hope pretty quickly, that none of us have healed any uh, blind people with a word. Uh, We haven't raised any dead people. Go, Go to the cemetery today and scream at them all you want. Let me know how it goes. Even the strongest faith among us won't be able to do it. And many of you will remind me that Benny Hinn and his ilk have been proven a phony a hundred times over. So we don't count them either in this. So what is really going on here? Context, context, context. Not everything Jesus said was meant to be directly and literally applicable to all believers universally. You know that intuitively as you read the scriptures. Let me tell you how I know you know that. Because all of you are sitting here and you have a lot of possessions. You've not sold everything to follow Jesus. You've not sold all your possessions and given it to the poor. And Jesus said that on more than one occasion to people. He said it to the rich young ruler. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. And yet we understand intuitively, right? That's a direct word with a direct application in an original context. It is a principle, however, that we would extract from that, that we are to be ridiculously generous because the gospel has absolutely been given to us and we have Christ. And so how could we not give and never allow our possessions to possess us? You see how this works? But you know that Jesus says things to people in the scriptures that is not directly and literally applicable to all believers everywhere, at least not in the direct literal sense. So I'm asking you, uh, here's another example by the way, (laughs) Jesus told the first disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you are given power from on high after his resurrection. We're not waiting in Jerusalem, we're here in Corinth, Indiana. Right? That was a specific word for specific people at a specific time. And there are more examples. I hope you get the point. And so I'm just asking you now, might it be the case that these words, these promises were restricted by Jesus to the apostles? Because that's the only people in the room. Sinclair Ferguson makes a very strong argument for that. Many other faithful Bible interpreters do as well. The book of Acts shows us definitively that this promise of Jesus was actually literally directly fulfilled only in the apostles. Have you read the book of Acts recently? It is only Peter and John who heal crippled people. Right? Paul preaches an all-night sermon. Some of you are thinking, this is a long sermon. No, I never preached all night and some young poor teenage boy fell asleep in an upper room window. You teenage boys, pay attention. Don't fall asleep because I'm not Paul. I can't raise you from the dead. He fell and he died and Paul, the apostle Paul did that, you see. So it's Paul, not Barnabas, not Silas, not Lydia, not Apollos. 
So in the literal direct sense, these promises Jesus made were actually fulfilled exactly as he said in his original audience. And it should not surprise us that after the apostles died, what is commonly referred to as signs and wonders and those kind of things, they pretty much disappeared off the scene. Church history bears it out. Until 1,800 years after Jesus ascended back to the Father, the modern-day Pentecostal movement claimed to have revived all of these things in mass. Charismatic movement. And I'm not saying everybody that's Pentecostal or charismatic is not a Christian. I have family members that I believe are saved and love Jesus that are in those movements. But I'm just trying to help you see things from a little more historically accurate and biblically faithful interpretation. So you can say, is there nothing for us here then? I mean, okay, thanks for that. Let's go home now, Pastor. Oddly enough, that is what Sinclair Ferguson essentially does with these three verses. I disagree with Brother Ferguson only with fear and trembling, but I do, I do disagree with him a little bit here. I think there's much for us actually here. Jesus does seem to indicate there are at least principles at work in a broader sense. Uh, the translation, my translation in verse 13, whatever you ask, and whoever believes, verse 12, that can be he who believes or whoever believes in me. So I want you, here's what I want you to see. I believe Jesus is on purpose showing the apostles that there's going to be a progression in the unfolding redemptive plan of God. And if we keep, if you stay with me, when we get into the next passages, you're going to see that this just keeps being Jesus' theme. So there's a progression here. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Apostles. That's the direct audience for that. And greater works will he do because I go to the Father. That's a progression, you see. And so there seems to be this idea that God the Father sends the Son. This has been John's theme. And he does his word and works through his son. Now God the Son is commissioning his believers and promising that he will continue to do his word and his works in and through them. Is this not amazing? And the why of it all, this is our second heading, Jesus says, is his ascension. Because I go to the Father. You see the progression and the redemptive plan of God for history? Father sends the Son, He accomplishes the redemptive plan of the Father, and that plan includes Him ascending. And if you keep reading, just two verses more, He's going to say, I'm, the Spirit's going to be sent. So now the Messianic Spirit age is upon us. There's a progression here, ordained and planned of God. Why? Why will these works be greater? And why will they be done at all? Because Jesus says, I am going to the Father. Here's His triumphal ascension. You see the foundation and the fuel for the greater works of believers is the ascension of Jesus back to the Father. That's what the causal phrase means. This is the reason Jesus is saying. Because I'm leaving and my leaving will send the Spirit and my word and my works will continue in and through you by His work. This is what he's going to say as we keep following his discourse. The apostles are struggling. We've said this before, and we would have been too if we were there. They're struggling. They're hurting. They don't like all this I'm leaving language. They're confused. Their view of Messiah is impinging upon them and causing them to be foggy on these things. And so they're struggling to see Jesus' ascension as a good thing. Jesus is going to, as we continue our study, he's going to assure them it's actually good. It's beneficial for you. This is God's plan. It's how it was planned all along. But you see, these 11 boys, they're, they're working with a, they're trying to put together a 5,000 piece puzzle without the box top. Now, my sister Nancy might be able to do that. Most of us can't. She's pretty gifted at puzzles. Not me. I can't even put together a 100 
uh, piece puzzle. Sometimes I can't even do that with the box top. They're working without the box top here. We sometimes forget. I remind us, we've got a full eyewitness testimony, full scripture, full Bible, and 2,000 years of church history, faithful interpreters. They're working without the box top. But Jesus has promised them, hasn't he? Afterwards, you will understand. He said that twice in chapter 13. Afterwards, things will change. After my death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, you're going to get it. Well, they did, by God's grace. Read the book of Acts. Read Paul's epistles. Paul says in Colossians 3, 1, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. The book of Hebrews said that. After he finished, he sat down at the right hand of the power of God. The picture you see now is complete for them. This is a completed task. The cross, the empty tomb, the resurrection, the ascension, and the sending of the Spirit is the ground and the guarantee of the greater works that Jesus talks about. And that's exactly what he says. Because I am going to the Father. This is how God planned it, you see. Jesus continues his word works in and through his believers. And he says that there'll be greater. Greater works. It's as if Jesus is saying, boys, you ain't seen nothing yet. Greater in what sense? Well, surely we can all understand, I hope, pretty easily how that has to at least be greater in quantity. Remember the cause. Because I'm going to the Father, I'm going to send the Spirit, and He's going to save 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost. And now look where we are. Believers by the millions all over the world, the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ has been multiplied myriads and myriads of times where there are now Christians in every corner of this globe. The word works of Christ have definitely been greater in quantity multiplied since his ascension to the Father. And we're all living proof if you're here and you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. We're part of those greater works of Jesus that he has multiplied quantitatively by the sending of the Spirit upon his ascension. You see, God planned it this way. Jesus is not offended that the Spirit has done greater works in and through his church. You think Jesus is offended that people are worshiping in the jungles of Peru today, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ? This is how God planned it. It's glorious. It is greater. And I want to make at least a small argument that it is greater even in some sense qualitatively. Now, I don't mean that literally. right? How do you improve upon raising Lazarus from the dead? How do you get better quality than that? That's not what I mean. I mean it's qualitatively better because this is actually how God's plan unfolds. It's meant to just get greater and greater. The word works of Jesus through his people just keeps getting better and better. And no, I'm not a post-millennialist. Those of you who know what that view is, I don't, I don't hold to that. But I do know that we are here in Corden, Indiana, separated by 2,000 years of history and half a globe's worth of distance, and we're worshiping the king, and we're praying to him, the same Jesus who said, Ask me, and we're asking. That's greater. How did this happen? It's fantastic, isn't it? We're gathering in his name and we're praying in his name and we're asking him to continue to use us, pitiful as we are, to show off his power to our next door neighbors and to people in Iran and China and Indonesia. There is a qualitative sense to the Father's plan, which it just keeps getting greater. Guaranteed by the ascension death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. Now how is this affected? Here we go. 
How much time I got? Not much. I don't really care, but... How? We've seen the what. We've seen the why. How does Jesus say this is going to happen? How is he going to multiply his word works in and through the apostles initially and then believers in Jesus Christ progressively? Well, he's going to give us, as we keep studying, he's going to keep fleshing that out, but the first answer he gives is one that if we're honest in the American church we would we would not think this way we don't think highly enough about our prayer lives but Jesus says the primary first way that his word and works will continue to be greater and greater is by God glorifying Christ centered prayers of his people Pray, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers. That was Jesus' missionary strategy. That wasn't the only thing he said, but it was the first thing he said. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. I don't know about you, but I have been deeply convicted by verses 13 and 14 in my time in this text and with the Holy Spirit of God. Anybody here want to say my prayer life is all it should be? Individually and corporately. Anybody would dare to say that? Through Christ-centered, God-glorifying prayers. Jesus will do his works through his people's prayers, he says. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Don't miss the I. These word works are still Jesus' works. They're not your works. You're not required to go bop people on the head and throw them on the ground and make them convulse like a dead chicken. These are the word works of Jesus being done through the powerful, Christ-centered, God-glorifying prayers of his people bought by his blood. I will do the work, Jesus says. You ask, I do. Hallelujah. Is this, is this exciting to anybody other than me? God increase my faith. Our faith. Not so we can turn this into some self-centered, self-serving heresy. That ought to make us all want to vomit. You see the two qualifiers Jesus gives? That's why I've said Christ-centered, God-glorifying prayer. Qualifier number one, in my name. You see that little phrase? He says it twice. God reveals himself in Scripture by his name. He cannot be separated from his name. The psalmist says, you have exalted above all your name and your word. So we know God by his names. We know who he is and how he acts, don't we? By his names. He is the Lord, our rock. He is the Lord, our redeemer. He is the Lord, our helper. He is the Lord, our shepherd. And we could go on and on. The Lord, our healer. You get it. The Lord who hears. These are his names. They reveal who he is and what he delights in doing, his character. To pray in the name of Jesus would have been radically new for these 11 elect. They have not yet prayed that way. Jesus is actually going to say that in John 16. You have not yet asked in my name. But the plan of God is unfolding, you see, and things are about to change. They're going to approach God now. Read the rest of the New Testament and you'll see they did. They approach God now with confidence, the book of Hebrews says, because we have a great high priest and he's our mediator. He's our intercessor. We ask him and he works. He works in a way that is consistent with who he is and what he has done, is doing, and will do. That's what we mean when we say in Jesus' name. We're saying in total submission to his lordship. We are saying whatever he does is best. I'm coming and I have requests, but in Jesus' name, I may need to give those up. I'm asking God to bring me into line with who Jesus is. 
with his heart, with his will, with his delight and affections. That's what it means to come to God in Jesus' name. How dare us turn it into something greedy and selfish. We are by definition saying, thy will be done when we say, in Jesus' name. I need to just tag on to this, by the way. That phrase, in Jesus' name, was not meant, then or now, to be a magic charm or um, some kind of mantra like a witch doctor would give you. Hey, say these words over and over. And it's like magic. Genie in the bottle, he has to do what you say. There are, I've, I know some, I mean, there are Pentecostal charismatic that teach this and they, they think they literally have to say out loud after every prayer, in Jesus' name, or nothing will actually matter. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying in Jesus' name out loud. That's not my point at all. But why are you doing it? It could be a problem. If you're doing it because you think it's some kind of magical formula that puts Jesus in a box and makes him give you whatever you want, well, this is not the biblical view of prayer. It's not the biblical view of God, not the biblical view of Jesus in whose name we pray. So that's qualifier number one. Uh, John, by the way, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, he lets Scripture interpret Scripture. He gives a qualifier or, or kind of an explanation. He says, we know that whatever we ask according to his will, he gives us. That's 1 John 5, 14. So John himself knows. He didn't take this from Jesus and say, I get whatever I want. No, he says, I get whatever God wills that I get. All right, that's how you pray in Jesus' name. Here's qualifier number two. You've already seen it, haven't you? You're ahead of me. In my name, and then Why? What's the heart of Jesus? So that the Father will be glorified in the Son. That is the eternal heartbeat of God the Son. That God the Father will be glorified in and through Him. So when you pray in Jesus' name and you tap into Jesus' heart, you're going to say, I trust you to do whatever will bring God the most glory. And it may hurt me. It may mean my foot keeps hurting for a month. Church, I'm just being honest with you. I feel like Apostle Paul. I've prayed, get rid of this, God. Please get rid of this. I, I don't like this pain. I don't like. Some of you know pain way more than me. Some of you sit in here, even spiritually, there may be challenges that God, God clearly wants for us, desires for us. Sometimes just sharing the gospel with a family member makes you fear and tremble, doesn't it? But you know it's the heart of God. So when you pray in Jesus' name and for Jesus' glory, for God's glory in Christ, this changes you. We, ugh, we don't pray to change God. I read somewhere, I do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed, Malachi. We don't change God. We pray so that God will change us. So that he'll make us conform to his will and so that he'll be glorified. Do you seriously think you know better how to get glory to God in your life than God does? Oh God, humble us. As Luke 17, the disciples, when they were being taught about prayer, oh, let's just go there. It's just better to go there. They, they said, increase our faith. <laughs> they understood right away, boy, we don't have that kind of faith. Jesus, we need help. In Luke 17, Luke 17, verse 1, and he said, this is Jesus, said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now look at how the apostles responded to that. They responded rightly, I think. 
Lord, increase our faith. We don't have enough faith to live like that. You're going to have to give it to us. And the Lord said, verse 6, If you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. I dare Kenneth Copeland to literally do that. You've never seen a prosperity gospel heretic speak to a tree and watch it uproot itself and levitate and float off into the sea. Be careful how you rightly divide the word. Clearly, if Jesus meant that literally, then the point is, boy, we are really little faithed. You know who's the only one who walked planet earth that actually could do that? Who actually did say to storms, stop. It's all about him, church. It's all about him. We dare not make it about us. We're little faithed. I don't care how big you think your faith is, it's not big enough. And when we get before the king one day, we'll understand. Boy, my faith was was not big enough. This Lord is infinitely bigger than I imagined or dreamed. And this is to whom we pray. See, the words in their original context, the original meaning, they're, they're powerful all on their own. You don't have to make this about some kind of materialistic desires you have. I, I may pray for a Mercedes Benz. I don't see anything in the scripture that tells me I can't do that. I mean, I can do that. But you know what I've learned? I've learned that God is far more glorified through his son Jesus Christ in my life when I learned to be content with my Toyota Corolla that has 200,000 plus miles and leaks when it rains. And if that's the case, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just happy it starts every time. So far, it just starts. It takes me where I need to go. It takes my wife where she needs to go. Pastor Bill Cook, who's also a professor at Southern Seminary, said it this way. I want to quote him. So I think he really gets down to where we live. When God's people are filled with God's spirit and word, they will pray big prayers to their listening father. Jesus is not stingy toward his people. He desires to answer prayer so that the father may be glorified. It is stunning that Jesus' followers do not spend more time praying in light of the magnificent promises he made in the upper room concerning prayer. We're inviting you on October 3rd, for those of you who are led of the Lord and are able medically to begin a fast with your family, to begin it sometime October 3rd, and we'll come together that night, Wednesday, October 4th, and we'll spend that hour begging God for revival here and all over the world. We have prayer meetings every fifth Sunday now. It's the same people that show up every time, the same 25 to 30. I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody here. I'm just asking you, especially members of this church, where are you when the church gathers to pray in Jesus' name? Ask me in my name and I will do it. Do we want to see Jesus do what we know he delights in doing? You all know what he delights most in doing, right? Saving wretched souls. Baptismal water stirred here and in China and in Bangladesh and in Chile, Indonesia, in Canada. I read a book earlier this year and I've quoted it already, but I just want to tell you again. A line in the book has stuck with me. He said, the problem in our prayer lives is not discipline, it's dependence. You don't need more discipline in your prayer life. That'll happen if you'll get more dependent. It's been true of me. I'm learning this. 
Here's a, a hymn from John Newton. I want to quote it in its full and then I'm done. But it's worth hearing if you've never heard this poem that was turned into a hymn by John Newton. Come, my soul, thy suit prepare. Jesus loves to answer prayer. He himself has bid thee pray, therefore will not say thee nay. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. With my burden I begin, Lord remove this load of sin. Let thy blood for sinners spilt set my conscience free from guilt. Lord I come to thee for rest, take possession of my breast. There thy blood bought right maintain and without a rival reign. As the image in the glass answers the beholder's face, thus unto my heart appear, print thine own resemblance there. While I am a pilgrim here, let thy love my spirit cheer. As my guide, my guard, my friend, lead me to my journey's end. Show me what I have to do, every hour my strength renew. Let me live a life of faith, let me die. Thy people's death. God, may this be our prayer. We want what brings you in and through your Son, our precious Savior, the most glory. And if that's something that's glorious and comfortable in this life, then so be it. But if it's not, so be it. And so stir us to be a praying people that your word and your works might continue to be done in a greater way, even in Cordon Baptist Church. And all God's people said,